a wide variety of cosmetics at their fingertips, Japanese women really go to town on their makeup. False eyelashes are just one of countless modern makeup techniques. The right makeup can transform your look. So I do my homework. It was in the 18th and 19th centuries that the custom of wearing makeup spread to the common people. Since then, makeup has never stopped evolving. Recently, women have taken to the internet to post videos of themselves applying makeup. Their creative techniques are now available for everyone to enjoy. On this edition of Begin Japanology, our theme is makeup. The surprising secrets behind Japanese beauty are about to be revealed. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Varakan. I'm in the cosmetics section of a Tokyo department store. Most department stores in Japan offer a number of different cosmetics brands, both domestic and imported. And most of the companies give advice to their customers. If you're interested in a certain product, they'll even give you a demonstration as you sit there. Now, one item that's been extremely popular with young Japanese women over the last few years is this. Now, I'm not the greatest expert in the world on false eyelashes, but I'd say these are pretty weird, some of these. These look like insect wings or something. These have, I don't know what those are made of, those little different colored balls on them. Anyway, let's get going with an overview of Japanese makeup. In Japan, chemists and drugstores carry a great deal of mass market cosmetics. The shelves are packed with merchandise. New products come in constantly, and large discounts are common. Women in their teens and twenties are the main buyers. Right now, women in those age groups just love false eyelashes. By drawing attention to the eyes, they can make a woman's face more alluring. I have narrow eyes. But uh, with false eyelashes, I can accentuate the eyelid so that my eyes look bigger. Most young women in Japan buy lots of cosmetics and carry a supply with them at all times. The Japanese cosmetics market is worth 1.4 trillion yen a year. It's a big industry with over 3,000 cosmetics manufacturers. This cosmetics retailer offers a new way for customers to choose their makeup. The store is integrated with a website, and the product lineup is guided by online reviews written by consumers. Scan a product's barcode, and you can see what people think of it. The voice of the user even determines where the product is placed on the shelf. I feel uneasy about using a product that I've never tried before. So it's reassuring to be able to read reviews by other people first. It makes me feel more like trying them out. I can try the products other people say are good and see what they're really like on my skin. The desire of women to look their beautiful best at all times is the driving force behind the constant evolution of Japanese cosmetics. But there is a disadvantage. Wearing makeup has pretty much become a social obligation for Japanese women. Looking presentable is sort of a given. It's just good manners. It's a rule of etiquette. You just shouldn't be seen in public without makeup. It's a no-no. Not wearing makeup makes me feel sloppy. With makeup, I feel on top of things. A lot of women first get serious about makeup when they start looking for jobs. <laughs> this is a makeup class for university students getting ready for the job hunt. Employees of cosmetics makers teach the students how to use the right makeup to look sharp, ambitious, and smart. With makeup, I feel more confident. That will definitely help me. 
On average, Japanese women spend one hour and 27 minutes per week on their makeup. A time-consuming endeavor, but a fun one. You get in the lift, go up to the seventh floor men's fashions, you walk out, walk around, and here's the cosmetics section. Cosmetics for men are actually becoming quite popular in Japan these days. Yes, Hello. Hello. Um, I can see you've got quite a lot of different cosmetics items here. Um, what sort of items do you tend to sell? Well, I'd say it's mainly anti-aging products. Mm. A lot of men are quite concerned about staying young and looking young. Mm. You're starting to make me feel anxious. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you look great. But maybe you'd like to give it a try? I guess I'm going to have to, aren't I? <laughs> We had one little problem here, which was that I've been wearing makeup for television, as I do every week, and I've had to take it off. So now we can get started, uh, Hoshi-san. Um, so what are we going to do? First, I'll moisturize your skin with this face lotion here. OK. Here we go. Okay. Next, I'm going to put on anti-aging cream. This will preserve the suppleness of your skin. OK, it will stop me aging. All right. That's probably better. Here we go. This is BB cream, made especially for men. BB cream? What is BB cream? This cream has a slight tint to it. It blocks UV radiation and it enhances the complexion of your skin. That's what it does. It's okay when you have somebody else doing it for you, but if I had to do this for myself every day, I don't know. So, are we finished? Actually, we're not quite done just yet. There's still more to come. We now have a concealer for men. It's used to keep an even skin tone and hide blemishes. Oh. Okay, I think I got some of them as well. Mm. All right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know if I look 20 years younger or not. I hope I do. But um, actually, I'm interested to know what kind of people come in here to buy cosmetics. Many of our customers are businessmen in their 40s or 50s working in this area. And quite a few of them use the full range of our cosmetics. OK, thank you very much. Interesting to know. Well, it was back in the 18th and 19th centuries that cosmetics really took off in Japan. Let's go back now and look at the history of makeup in this country. Japanese cosmetics have been traced back to magical rituals for protection from evil. Examples include human images with red face paint found in ancient graves. Makeup for beauty purposes probably dates to the late 6th century, when rouge and face powder arrived from China, together with the techniques used to apply them. A few centuries later, aristocrats began to paint their faces white, add stylized eyebrows, and blacken their teeth. Uniquely Japanese makeup was born. But back then, the style of makeup was determined by age, social status, and so on. It was not a means of self-expression. Two or three centuries ago, makeup spread like wildfire through the population at large during the golden age of Edo culture. Making ingenious use of just white, red, and black, women took pleasure in devising all kinds of new looks. This is a three-volume book that was published in 1813. It's a contemporary makeup manual. Here's a way to use makeup to give a flat nose a sharper appearance. Apply white heavily along the ridge as a highlighting technique. The book runs to over 100 pages and it's full of these tricks. The face powder was applied with extreme care. Let's watch a recreation of powder application based on the old manual's instructions. A brush is used to carefully spread the mixture of powder and water. 
Then a sheet of paper is pressed on to pick up excess powder and moisture. After repeating this process several times, only the finest particles of face powder are left on the skin, forming a thin layer. The underlying tone shows through, bringing out the natural glow of the skin. And here's a bright rouge applied on the lips. Before the mid-19th century, rouge was made mainly from safflower. The petals look yellow, but they contain a red pigment. The petals are plucked and kneaded in water, washing away the soluble yellow pigment and leaving only the red pigment. When dried, this turns into a bright red substance that is the base ingredient for the rouge. In this woodblock print, upper and lower lips are different colours. The lower lip has the iridescent style, which was in fashion then. As the rouge is applied in several thin layers, its colour changes. And with high-quality rouge, an iridescent sheen will appear. Using this technique, complex colour effects can be created from one kind of rouge. However, only the rich could afford lavish use of high-grade rouge, and iridescent lips became a symbol of wealth. Most women would dissolve tiny amounts of rouge in water to make this precious cosmetic last. Later, as Japan opened up to the world and westernized in the late 19th century, cosmetics underwent a rapid evolution. In the 1920s, so-called modern girls in Western clothes appeared in Japan's cities. The flashy makeup they wore was the talk of the town. After the Second World War, opportunities for women expanded rapidly. As they spent more time out of the home, in the workplace, and having fun, makeup became a must. Various makeup trends followed. In the 1980s, with the economy at its peak, the popular style was strong eyebrows with bright red lipstick. Bold makeup was in fashion. After the economic bubble burst, harder times ushered in a more natural look, and thinner eyebrows also came into fashion. The way women use makeup has been a mirror of changing times in Japan. This is a research facility run by one of Japan's major cosmetics makers. They've got a whole library of books in here, which is open to the public once a week. Plus, there's a display of all kinds of implements here, and I'm going to get an explanation of that from Takako Murata, who's been studying Japan's makeup culture for many years. Thank you for being with us today. Hello. Konnichiwa. Now, I certainly wouldn't have guessed that any of these are related to makeup. How far back in history are we going here? We believe these date to the late 18th or early 19th century. These probably belong to someone from an upper-class samurai family. Perhaps you can explain what all of these are. These ones here were used for a kind of makeup I believe is unique to Japan. It's a set for blackening your teeth. You make the tooth blackening liquid in this part, then you put it into this little container right here and heat it up a bit. Then you add a powder called fushi powder and stir it in. That turns the liquid black. It's a chemical reaction. Then you use this brush to apply the liquid on your teeth. But it tastes very bitter. So you put water into this bowl here and use it to gargle. After you gargled, you'd spit. Spit out here into this large bowl. <laughs> it's a spittoon, okay. That's really interesting. I had no idea that you were doing anything like that. And these big boxes here? Well, in those days when noble women and samurai class women reached a certain age, they would shave their eyebrows and paint false ones up here. These are eyebrow makeup boxes to contain implements used for that. These brushes and various other items were kept in them. Here we have a razor. 
You see it's shaped with an angle on top. You can shave this way, or you can shave this way. It's double-edged. And you keep the razors in these boxes. Wow, so the traditional Japanese style of over-packaging things isn't something that started recently. We're going back at least a couple of hundred years. Interesting, isn't it? Very beautiful, though. And over in this corner, we have presumably these are a little further down the social scale. These all would have been used by the common people. Mm -hmm. Here's the rouge, very expensive back then. It was sewn like this, painted inside a saucer. Oh, you buy the little saucer and it already has the rouge inside it. If you left it out in the light, the color would fade. So when you weren't using it, you turn it upside down. They didn't have lids. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, little implements for you? For, for these are portable items. You could put this in your kimono sash and get it out when you need some rouge. You lick your finger and... Yes. Ah. You coat the inside with rouge and carry it about. Ah. Thank you very much. It's really quite interesting how developed the whole culture of makeup was in Japan, uh, at least, what, go, going back nearly 200 years now. Well, these implements are obviously have a lot to do with that development. And there's one makeup accessory in Japan now which is being sought out by makeup artists all over the world. Let's take a look. Kumano is a town among the mountains in Hiroshima. From writing brushes to paintbrushes to makeup brushes, 80% of Japan's brush production is based here. A few hundred years ago, life in Kumano was tough, and residents were forced to migrate for work. One migrant worker learned brush making and took the art back to his hometown. It eventually became the main industry. Here we find one of the leading brush making companies in Kumano. It produces 500,000 brushes every month. They focus on makeup brushes in particular. Various kinds of animal fur, including squirrel and horsehair, are used for different types of brush. All the brushes are handmade and meticulously crafted by skilled artisans. The founder of the company, Kazuo Takamoto, puts the finishing touches to these brushes. Using a dulled razor, he picks out and removes any low-quality hairs. With his finely honed sense of touch, he perfects each brush by hand. Bad hairs are removed before the brush is shaped. But with hundreds of thousands of hairs, a few will slip through. I catch those stray hairs at this final stage and take them out. The key attribute of Takamoto's brushes is that they use untrimmed hairs. When the brush is laid against the skin, it needs to perfectly follow the surface of the skin in order to apply the makeup. It's important that it lies flush on the skin. On brushes where the hairs have been trimmed, the tips are bristly. They don't fit to the skin. I think that's the most crucial part. It really is. On the right is a cheek brush that Takamoto made using hair with tips intact. On the left is a mass market brush made from trimmed hairs. Powder is applied on tissue paper using the trimmed hair brush. It leaves an uneven smear. But Takamoto's brush lays down the powder evenly and smoothly. Convinced of their quality, Takamoto took his brushes to trade shows abroad. Today, he gets orders from 250 companies. These days, makeup tries to recreate a natural look. So, what we have to do now is to make brushes that can contribute to that look. The trends keep changing, and we have to deliver what's required by the trends. I think that's what I like. I enjoy the challenge. As makeup fashions change, 
makeup brushes also have to evolve. The handmade brushes of Kumano are playing an important role at the forefront of the makeup world. This is one of those Kumano brushes that we've just been looking at, and it does kind of caress the skin very nice. And this whole shop is just full of brushes from Kumano, as we've just seen in the video. I'm going to be talking to Yuka Takeshima, who's the manager here. Hello, thank you for being with us today. Hello. You have a large number of brushes here in this shop. How many in all? We have close to 800 varieties. What? <laughs> yes. Hi. What's the main difference between these? I mean, how do you explain it to the customers? First of all, understanding the nature of each type of hair is really important to our brush making. And in terms of different kinds of hair, the biggest difference would come from how firm they are. A softer brush has a gentler touch, and a color comes out lighter. Whereas with a springier brush, the color will be stronger. <laughs> so what have I got here in my hand? This is a brush for your cheeks, made from grey scroll hair. This is definitely one of the softer brushes. So if I wanted something a little firmer, what, what would I choose? Well, here's one example. This one uses goat hair. Goat? OK. That's how I feel. Oh, yeah. That's uh, it's, it's quite a difference, actually. And they, they look, obviously, the color's different. They, they look quite similar, though. This is a soft grey squirrel brush for a lighter touch. As you can see, even when using a powder with strong colour, this can create a subtle, natural-looking tone. Now, let's try the firm goat brush. Compared to the squirrel hair brush I just used, it's better at really expressing the colour. You can see that the colour comes out stronger. Can you see the difference? Take a closer look, then. Wow, yes. Uh, perhaps it's because I'm a man and don't often think about these things at all, but the difference between the two sides, just using different brushes with the same makeup, is uh, absolutely clear, isn't it? It's, uh, it's quite impressive. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, the traditional craftsmanship of these brushes is being maintained by artisans. But at the same time, as far as makeup techniques are concerned, there are now lots of amateur makeup fans who are coming up with interesting techniques and novel ways of sharing them with the world as well. Let's get started. From bare face to full makeup, the transformation process is recorded on video and put online by the so-called beauty vloggers. The unique makeup tricks they come up with are sweeping the internet. On this makeup video site, hundreds of beauty vloggers have uploaded videos. The spread of smartphones has made it easy for anyone to post videos, and that has led to a video blogging boom. Hello. This is Chihiro. A popular beauty vlogger with four million views on her online video channel. She's a university student studying applied chemistry. In her spare time, she shoots makeup tutorial videos in her room. Her shooting setup is very simple. First, she puts up a cloth backdrop. Then she sets up the camera and lighting, and she's ready to shoot. What makeup are you doing today? Today it's about coloured eyeliner. As the camera rolls, Chihiro shows each makeup item and explains what she is doing. Let's start with the eye makeup. I'm going to use this straight edge. Place it at the corner and draw the wing. Then paint it in. If you think it's going to be hard for you to make the line, draw a sharp, thin line first, then make it thicker. The secret of Chihiro's popularity is her unique makeup techniques. She presents ways to use everyday objects to do makeup, ways to apply your makeup in just three minutes, and various other clever ideas. Thank <laughs> you. 
She does all the video work herself too, from editing to uploading. Since she started posting videos about two years ago, Chihiro has put more than 60 online. Every time she uploads a new video, she gets a lot of comments. These days, they even come from outside Japan. I'm just making videos here in my room, but so many people watch them and send me comments. I really appreciate that. Chihiro's videos draw enough views to earn her some spending money. When a video becomes popular, companies put advertisements around it. And each time the video is played, Chihiro earns a small amount from the advertiser. She also gets requests from cosmetics makers to feature their products in her videos. So far, she has made videos featuring the products of more than 10 companies. Chihiro is starting to think that she could actually make a living from beauty vlogging after finishing her studies. I try to make videos that are interesting to my viewers. I want to make videos that people enjoy watching. I hope to keep on doing that. Beauty vloggers who love cosmetics. They're turning Japanese makeup techniques into popular entertainment. The internet has given us the opportunity to share just about anything and everything, so I probably shouldn't have been surprised to see women sharing their makeup techniques. One other thing the internet has done is to prove Andy Warhol's famous prediction that everybody will have their 15 minutes of fame, and I suspect that may have been on some of their minds at least. As you've already seen, I use makeup on this program, although I've got to say my favorite part of the show is when we finish shooting and I get to take it off. Having watched the entirety of today's show, on which Japanese women evidently find lots of ways to enjoy their cosmetics, I've got to say I'm really glad that I was born a guy. I'll see you again next time. With bold compositions and bright colors, ukiyo-e woodblock prints depict everyday life in bygone days. Van Gogh and Monet were among those influenced by the ukiyo-e aesthetic.